hi to everyone watching on the RNTM Facebook and YouTube channel. I'm Georgie, postgraduate singer at the RNTM. Um, hello to all my fellow RNTM students who are joining us on Zoom for this Q&A with esteemed mezzo Alice Coote, OBE, who I welcome now. Hello, Alice. Hello. Hello. <laughs> there she is. Hello. How are you, Alice? I'm cold. I just oh. arrived at my house and I, my boiler isn't working. So the sort of thing of being prepared, if I ever say what you should do as a student is always be prepared, then I've just failed the audition. Failed to do that. <laughs> a bit of warming up <laughs> necessary in a purely physical sense at this stage. Yes. I think the scarf's <laughs> going on. Do you mind? Oh, that's completely. We can give you a second to scarf up <laughs> for yes. sure. Hello, everybody. Um, so I suppose um, I will broach the, the elephant in the 2020 room in the first instance and uh, ask the obvious question of, of how how has this year been for you? Um, how how have you been, been coping and staying motivated during this bizarre plague year that we find ourselves in? Well, I mean, if I'm completely honest, just from my point of view, I mean, whenever I say anything right now, I always immediately think, in fact, I'm loving the fact that I'm actually talking to students this afternoon because right now I feel in a very privileged position because I see this time for me as a sort of welcome, some of it's not been welcome, so a welcome hiatus from the frenetic thing that's been my life for the last um, three decades. But when every time I think that, I think, oh, I'm not going anywhere. I haven't got to pack a suitcase. I haven't got to live out a suitcase. I'm living out of one fridge in the same bed looking out the same view every day and I'm not on my own, I'm, I'm close to family, that in my mind, and I'm, I'm not actually, for the first few months, I wasn't really craving performing or really craving being on a stage. Every time I think of that though, I get this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach of what would it have been like for me if I didn't have this backlog of, of, of performing and music making that I felt that filled me up to, to here at that point when I stopped. And I was actually trying to say to the world, hello, here I am, I want to take part. I want to make music, I want to be a part of your world and it all shut down. So if I was a student right now and a young person, I would have the absolute diametric point of view of the one I've just stated to you. But for me, it's been uh, a different pace of life, a sort of a way to actually feel like a normal person, although I doubt I can ever sort of be in that category for all the wrong reasons, but... Um, Yes, it's been a hard one. My, I've been with my family. Um, unfortunately, uh, two months ago, my father died, uh, not of COVID, but of old age complications. And that was very, very difficult. But it also meant um, that I was able to be in this country and I didn't actually get a horrendous call uh, saying, can you get back from America and you, right. you won't be able to get there in time, which has been the reality for a lot of the big landmarks in my life yeah. to, to date, that I've been elsewhere. So. It's been, that's been my personal point of view, but from the musical point of view, it's been devastating um, for the, the reasons I said earlier on of the feeling of our community, that in itself, the arts community at large, humanity itself, but also just in a selfish way for us, for music making, for the feeling that maybe uh, people were forgetting, although I'm, I feel in my heart that the longer this goes on, people are being reminded more, even if they're not in the music industry, what being able to see somebody do something live, be it sport, be whatever, but especially music, that what it all really means to us. We are really reminded what it is if we can't be in the room, even if it's a rock concert or it's a whatever it is. If we can't be in the room with somebody else making music or performing, and if we feel that that actually, the industry and that's chance for the future and future generations is damaged, which is what I have hoped and crossed my fingers for, I don't think it necessarily will, but it's been deeply upsetting. And that was a very long answer. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I think you're right to tr treat it from these two different perspectives, because obviously it can be sort of, it is terrifying for the industry in one sense, but you know, you you're right to say that for for people with a lot of who've had these crazy frenetic careers for a while actually having that slowing down time is probably valuable from both a personal 
and even maybe a, a musical perspective. I mean, I suppose you might have been absolutely able to sing things that stuff, sing things that were like your choice to sing rather than whatever's the next thing in the diary, um, which, you know, maybe could be a valuable. Absolutely. Option. I've got a cupboard down there and I thought, because usually you're just thinking, oh my God, I really want to sing something in that cupboard over there, but I've got to learn this piece of music, which I didn't necessarily choose to, to right. learn. Everybody, students know what this is like. You've got the song class coming, you've got to learn this thing, but actually you want to sing something over there. You don't feel ready to sing the thing in front of you. You barely feel ready to sing the thing behind you. But somebody's saying, in five minutes' time, you've got to sing this. And, and it's that sort of frenetic thing where music sometimes becomes a pressure. I mean, I'm not saying life should always be a pleasure, but it becomes not your relationship with the music, it becomes your relationship with the pressure of the music rather than um, the poetry or the great music. And you forget to go, oh my God, right. this music is the greatest thing I've ever seen and heard and I want to sing it. You sometimes yeah. lose that feeling. That, the fact that you're actually wanting to do it rather than it being you yeah. know, required or you know obliged of you. Exactly. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, speaking of the breadth of repertoire that that you do I mean you sing a lot of operatic roles obviously and you know trouser roles in particular people really um think you do a fantastic job of but you also oh, are respected for your leader and concert singing recitals um was this something that you were always able to sort of thread into your career from the start or do you feel like one one's preceded the other um I'm interested on your thoughts on the, the balance between opera and Concert. Well, well, it's funny because um, my relationship did start with uh, music song, just the purity of song and text first, because I, I learned with a lady, I had lessons with a lady um, who lived in our local village, who, who in turn had um, lessons, she was in her 50s, with a lady who was rather grand, an elderly grand uh, singing teacher in Manchester, who I remember saying to me, you've got to give up everything, you've got to give up sex, you've got to give up men, you've got to give up your life, you won't ever have your thing. If you've got to want to sing, you will want to sing. And I sort of was went pale inside, but sort of still thought, I really want to have a go. I'm prepared, I'll do anything. But this lady uh, in the village was, I remember her putting in front of me things on the music stand, like a photocopy with her blue biro at the top, with the translation, the exact translation of the words of what it could be like, si not Silent Noon, but anything like a wonderful Schubert song mm. or Silent Noon with the text written out in a wonderful English poem. But it was always, she always had written at the top before you got to the music in her biro, she was interested in, and that just became something natural. I didn't go, oh, that's what you do. It just went in naturally, I think. And I was thinking about that today, how lucky I was. But she always wrote at the top the exact words of what the poetry meant or the text meant or just the text on its own, even if it was oratorio or something like that. So I saw the words and I still have some of those beautiful copies those with the staples in the side of them with her writing on. And that's what went into my brain at the beginning was I started off as an oboist mm -hmm. and played piano and things like that. I wanted to be in an orchestra. But once I had these singing lessons with this lady um, and I had felt this voice inside me, but she plonked these things on this rickety music stand in front of me that had these words. It was a double gift and it was, uh, it was a specific thing that somebody was trying to evoke. It wasn't just being a part of an orchestra. It was words and text and humanity and ideas. Yeah. And I was doing into my brain and the challenge and the, the, the excitement of poetry um, set me as much on fire as the music itself. So that was in my um, musical want, my musical DNA from the beginning. And I went through, all, you know, I listened to Fisher Disco, I listened to Janet Baker, all the great lead singers, Ellie Amling, F. Schwarzkopf. I used to listen to every single recording of each song to see who did it best. And then leaf through, because in those days you couldn't, go, <laughs> I'm so old, you couldn't go into the, you know, in, onto, um, YouTube. Spotify, I don't even manage Spotify. You couldn't even go onto Apple and immediately download all the albums. You had to go go in on the tube or go in your car to the library. I mean, I know hello people out there. This did actually happen. There was build okay, there was buildings. You got in a car, you drove along some tarmac, and you gave them a little a card and you handed it to them. They said, Yes, that's you. You can walk in and you got to a thing like a shelf. It's a shelf. Wood with books on it and you pull it out or there's a CD and you actually pulled out the little insert to the CDs you know those books and you could leaf through and as you were leafing through 
I would go, oh my God, there's a poem about Du brachst in und die kalte Rinde. And I'd see this one, what does that mean? And then I'd see the poems. And I forget what I was actually looking for and come across these, but oh my God, that's a great song. I haven't got time to sing that now. I hope in 20 years time I can sing that. Oh God, look at that poem. And it was always that. So that was my first love. And I wanted to do that first. And I ended up doing that first, but in my own kitchen and my own bathroom more than I did it anywhere else. But my agent always said to me, you've got to stick with the opera, get, let people know who you are with the opera. And as soon as you've done a lot of opera, people will then ask you to do recitals or concerts. And I thought, well, okay, I'll put my head down, much as I love opera, um, love opera, um, from the very first moment I got on the stage, I always wanted to get back to that pure thing of me, the music and the poetry and my choices, not the conductors, my choices, not the directors, my choices with the, with the accompanist, with the pianist. Oh, that was a faux pas, wasn't it? Sorry, all the previous accompanists, pianist. <laughs> uh, you know, that. Yeah. that That's is, another that long is answer. Lovely, that is a lovely a thing with doing, with song repertoire. I think you're right. It's that collaborative, like personal choice aspect, which obviously sometimes- Well, you, you make different. your own production. You make yeah. your own yeah. choices. You can decide in your head well, you can decide if you want to be, you know, standing on top of a fridge in your mind, or, you know, you can be doing anything in your mind and create that whole production. Someone isn't going to say, come on, you've got to sing uh, this aria standing on top of a fridge, even if you don't want to. You can say, no, I don't want to stand on top of a fridge in my head. If a director says to me, I've had this brilliant idea. I want you to be the opposite of what it says in this aria. You can make that choice in your head and say, no. I don't want to do that. I want it to be about love. I want it to be about the moonlight shafting down on me, not shafting down on me on top of a fridge. Yeah. You can make those choices. I'm sounding very damaged by directors right now. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think there's, you know, it's that pure connection to the text and music and that that trio without too much interference, I suppose. You got um, it, but it's also the blowing open wide of every single choice you can possibly have when you're standing in your room on your own, preparing this song or this song recital. You can make every single choice you want to phrase by phrase, word by word of what this really means and what image that that gives you in your head. Therefore, how you sing the first consonant of the word, how you sing the final consonant of the word, how you link it to the next word, what color you choose, what dynamic. I mean, obviously directed by what's written on the page by the composer, but you have got all the choices, all the colors in your paint box and they're yours and they're nobody else's. Yeah. And that's a thrill actually, especially after a few years of people sent, telling you to stand on a, on a fridge. <laughs> Quite. Um, I wanted to ask, do you, do you feel as though there was a sort of big break for you in your career, like a specific time or, or performance that you can pinpoint? And if, if so, how, how and, and when did this come about? Or do you not feel like that's something that you sort of relate to as an idea? Well, I think in anybody's life, there's sort of, maybe there are a few stories where people have a big break and they sang on a stage and, and everybody went absolutely wild and they sang 10 encores. Um, for me, it didn't feel really particularly like that. It felt uh, more out of a choice, really, um, somewhere deep inside, and also out of circumstances. It was more of a long slog, really, because I started off and went to college when I was 18, far too soon, and I went from Cheshire um, in the middle of nowhere in country schools and that sort of environment, bus to school, back again, never seeing anything, straight to the centre of London, to the Guildhall, and I didn't finish that course because I was so overwhelmed by the people being fabulous in the in the in the um college and being terribly together and the reality of london itself i just it was overwhelming i, I lost the reason of what i was doing really and i was too shy and to to cope with the whole sociological situation of being in a college and being what i thought was just me and some music and some words was suddenly being part of competition and going into a song class and who's the best and it was this competitive environment that I found really disturbing. So I didn't do very well with that. Um, but I went on then and sort of left college and then I went through doing lots of op, um, office jobs, shop jobs, telesales, temping, making a complete dog's dinner of, of, of trying to work on a switchboard, you know, with the I don't know, managing director coming around 17 times, having never put him through. I gave away a lawnmower in, B&Q once by mistake because I was so in love with the 
with the assistant manager. But anyway, that took me to my late 20s before I started launching forth onto sort of the European opera scene. And a lot of the time I was doing things like doing a, a small role in Stuttgart one night. And the next night I was on tour um, in doing sort of um, a small, two small parts in um, Popea, in Monteverdi's Popea, in the WNO tour. I mean, years went by with me having to go from Stuttgart, leave the stage, go home, get two hours sleep, get on two planes across Europe to Southampton, go to either like try to get to Swansea or Southampton, go and do the show, which had, I remember there's one that had about eight costume changes, including having a great big dome head, you know, tiny, two little tiny parts, getting back on the, um, in a taxi to an airport hotel, then getting out again um, after about two hours sleep and getting a plane, two planes across Europe to get back to Stuttgart to do another small role. And that went on for years, but I really learned more there than I ever learned after that. Well, that's not true. That's not actually true. But I learned a lot in a short space of time in a pure observing other people, observing other great singers, really, really great singers um, during that time. And that went on for a long time. And then I was noticed sort of still hacking on, still fighting on, working really hard, doing Stutt uh, the Stuttgart um, Alcina production that went to the Edinburgh Festival. And then a couple of months later, I was singing the title role in Popea and Coronation of Popea. I finally worked my way up to Popea, the title role after all those years. But along the way, I had people like the great Gwyn Howell, the bass, saying to me on a stage rehearsal where I was trying to like bite off a carrot with a trill beyond, trying to be terribly funny. He was, came up to me and said, don't ever forget but it's always the music first. I'm not sure I've always remembered that, but don't ever forget this. And I thought, oh God, this is great when Howe telling me not to sort of be more interested in being funny than actually remember to sing. And I, the things I learned, I would prefer to not have had, you know, the 10 ovations, because I feel like I really, when I got there, I'd learned my craft, which is something I think is sometimes missing in the today's pro process where people get on Instagram and 15 minutes later, they've got an album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more of a, maybe than a big moment. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, that's interesting to hear. And like just getting a bit of life experience, like along the way as well. And going through that kind of gives you that grit, I think to maybe endure, which is, yeah. Probably it really important. does. And that's why I think even now, this situation now, if students are in this situation now, they think, Oh my God. You know, I can't, I'm not singing, I'm no one's seeing me. I'm about to leave college. Uh, will the world still exist? Or I've spent eight, you know, maybe some people have actually isolated in their rooms alone. Maybe they've actually lost the belief that they can make this into a career or lost the belief that they will ever see their stu other student friends again or sing to each other or have any chance to do an audition and maybe go and get a job or any of those things or even just be with a pianist and sing or have some validation of what they've done or maybe they actually feel like they can't the stress of the world the upset of the world the way the world is uh feels like it's turned on its head and it's almost like world war three in our own homes we feel quite depressed a lot of the time maybe if we feel like this is interminable and you know okay there's going to be a vaccine next summer or next e easter and will we get will the arts exist will the theaters exist I would say to you, anybody's feeling, I can't practice, I can't even be bothered. Do I even want to be part of this industry? Do I, whatever that may be, teaching, singing, being in the chorus, being a singer, if you want to be pack your bags for 25 years and you know, sing main roles or anything you want to do to do with music, if we all feel very low and hopeless about it, I would say that that's a good thing. Mm. I would say that that's you know, character building, but it's also, the chance for us to really forget about the Instagram, you know, look at me, I just sang last week. Oh, look at what dress she's wearing. Oh, look, this competitive, da, 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 da. and actually stand in our kitchens and think, do I want to sing? Or do I want to play the violin? Or do I want to, and actually have that relationship again without all the noise yeah. and know how much it really means to us personally and in the wider community, know what it means. That we, the reason that we're doing this and know for us what it means and having a bit of suffering and having a bit of too much silence and having a bit of too much of yourself and having a bit of misery 
can often give you the ammunition to do some really great things artistically later in life, as good as it doesn't feel um, at the time. And I, feel, I believe in, in, in young people to, uh, to actually turn this around into something where they have more grit than they ever thought they would because they want it more, maybe. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. That was a long speech. I'm so <laughs> I, sorry. Don't worry. I totally, you know, I, it, I, it totally resonates with me. What you were saying earlier about your, your first teacher sort of saying, you have to give everything up. You have to give up men. You have to give up. I sort of, you know, I, I understand that viewpoint, but I also think you have to, you have to go through it. You have to live things to be able to express them uh, like on stage and to, to yeah. have those, those feelings. So I think that all that, you know, there's, there's, there's both arguments. Um. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. They've got nothing to express unless you've, uh, you've, you've, you've felt it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so another question. Um, do you, Alice, consider yourself a perfectionist? And I was thinking about, you know, whether perfectionism is something that you think is, is useful to a singer or something that can be inhibiting to an extent, maybe it's both. Um, what, you know, it never really feels like a piece is ever ready to perform for me. And I'm sure a lot of people relate to that. Um, what are your thoughts on that as a, as on perfectionism for singers? Uh, I think members of my family would giggle when they hear, if somebody asks me, you know, if I'm a perfectionist, because I, I'm, you know, I'm, a little bit intense about it but I don't actually even though I want to do my very very best and I, I do actually hate that word uh perfectionist because there will a perfectionist will always by definition be a failure so um it's a bit of a worry unless maybe there are somewhere out there the perfect if you're a scientist the perfect equation or a mathematician maybe that exists but it doesn't exist in music and it doesn't exist in life um, so while I might want to do the perfect soft onset, you know, one bar, you know, manage to achieve something technically or manage to achieve the perfect color in one thing, that is a split second to split second thing. And as a totality, uh, no one, not the greatest singer ever will ever make a completely perfect, there is no one. I mean, maybe this couple of recordings, you know, of Fisher D. Scow singing a Schubert song that's as close as you can get to it, but it still will never be no one, not just singers, any musician, because it is by definition time moving, mm. time shifting. There is a perfect moment, but there is not a perfect long-term time as in life. You can't have the perfect conversation. You can't have a perfect love affair. You can't have the perfect um, relationship. You can't have a perfect walk. You can't have a perfect sky. Well, you can't have a perfect sky because every sky is perfect. But um, so therefore you've got to, Try and be perfect in your kitchen or in wherever you're practicing in the moment to moment thing. That's what I've sort of told myself. I've got to, what I try to do is be as perfect as I can in my preparedness. But my overarching philosophy, as I'm sure is for everyone, is the reason why we're doing this is to say something yeah. to each other. So if you're standing in front of people trying to be perfect, like as if you were standing in front of people trying to have a perfect conversation or be the perfect person or look perfect or say something perfect, then you will inevitably inhibit yourself to a point where you aren't saying anything. And I really sort of um, feel it's more important to say something to each other while we can than to be perfect while we're doing it. But having said that, you'll say things. I always try to remember that I'll say things to people better if I perfect my language uh, before I set off with a sentence. So I practice as much as I can, but then I try to let go and yeah. be honest. So the armory of, of, of the best work I've done, whatever that's managed to be in, in the background is there, but I try to sort of let go of it all. It's a framework in my mind as I'm performing, um, but I know I've got to forgive myself in the moment because if I fail to do anything technically right or as the plan you've always got to have that voice if it goes wrong where you're forgiving yourself um, as you go along well that was wrong that was the worst thing in the world that was terrible I'm a disaster I'm a total loser next keep going so it's it's that little voice yeah I think once you get to a you, you know perfect at home then forgive yourself once you're out there and actually communicate is definitely the, the way to the way forward. ideally I mean, that's the ideal. One will always want to go off stage and shoot yourself or think you were brill and actually it was the worst thing you've ever done. 
So you just can only do what you can do and just yeah. do, do your best in life on any level because it's quite a hard task life, I think. Um, who, who, Alice, are your favourite composers or some of your favourite composers to sing? Um, I was wondering if there are any specific composers operatic or otherwise that you keep coming back to feel like you have things to learn from throughout throughout your life and career everything <laughs> just everything everything I've ever come across and everything certainly the thing I'm singing at the time yeah. because you go so deeply into it so there's always something to I mean I did think you know I have been asked I just have thought about that so many times and it is always the thing that I'm working at at the time unless it's something I don't particularly love which is rare and then I'm always hankering to get back to one of my favorite roles or songs or, or something like that. But it's always the discovery of new music and it's always the discovery of a new phrase or a new song or a new role or you know, a new piece that I'm not even in or the piano part of something or an orchestral interlude if I'm learning an opera or an aria of somebody else's or a tiny passage just before somebody starts singing or it's always that, it's those moments where you think, my God, that expresses something to me that I never, um have heard before in music and something that i perhaps have never felt in a world that i didn't know existed where a composer creates either through a song or or creating a sound world where you feel like you've gone into a whole other existential area because of the sound world is like traveling without traveling it's like everyone says i want to travel the world and i want to see all the great landmarks but for me each time i learn some music or I hear some new music that I've never heard or I go to a concert or I go to a theatre I go to it feels like I'm entering an entire universe a new universe so it is it's a miraculously exciting deep experience and that's just how music goes into me so it's just everything really it's I, there's too much music and not enough time yeah totally <laughs> um I think we're going to take some questions from um, my fellow RNCM students now. Um, uh, so if you guys could raise your raise your hand, then um, Paul will put you through to Alice. Um, I'm trying to do a thing. Questions. <laughs> mm. Or we can keep talking. Either way, depends if anyone's going to ask anything. Oh. <laughs> I'll keep going until someone they'll they'll I'll give them time to think. Um Come on guys. No, I'm gonna have to think off the cuff, aren't I? Um Raise your game. <laughs> Ask the freezing woman in Cheshire <laughs> a question. I could ask oh, I could ask I a very cliche question. Um Would I be able to ask a question? Sorry. Hello! Is that okay? Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk so far. It's just inspiring hearing you talk about your life. I love it. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> so thank you. Um, thank I, you. I just wondered um, when you decided to change from playing the oboe to singing. Um, so what guided you in doing that? Because I'm a clarinetist personally, um, but I've Ooh. always loved to sing and I've never had lessons. Um, and it's always intrigued me because I, I admire all of my singing friends and I think they're incredible. Um, but I'm wondering about trying it out and what you think about sort of going into something new as an instrumentalist as well. Oh, you should definitely try it out. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, what we're all trying to do is be singers. I mean, I don't know how you feel about your instrument, whether you feel that the clarinet is your voice, if you have that relationship with it. Yeah, I feel like it's the um, the thing I find most difficult and easy about it simultaneously because it feels like um, every time I play that it is my voice, but also enable um, to try and make myself perform my best and to convey as much, I have to get rid of the technical um, sort of barrier that is my instrument to be able to sing because when I sing just normally even if it isn't great it's automatically my voice and where I want it to go whereas for me the instrument is my barrier but also my gateway into doing yeah. it anyway oh my god that is so interesting and brilliantly put but do you feel that the sound of the clarinet is is you 
That's such an interesting question. Um, I think sometimes it depends on the piece and what I'm trying to say within it because especially with certain composers it's it's like it's a match made in heaven um mm. and that it's what they were trying to say fits the clarinet voice whereas mm. certain things I feel like I might want to convey in a piece it might not come come across as well because of the tone of the instrument whereas yeah. with a with a human voice you can you know exactly sort of um like when you have a conversation, you know where the inflections go because of um, how you naturally express yourself to other people. Um, mm. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I'll try and think more about that. I'm, I'm um, ending up interviewing you, but I'm just so interested because <laughs> I, I don't really know why I why I went to be a singer, but then looking back retrospectively, it's the only thing I could have done. I was think I was just lucky that I got terribly jealous about... Um, people singing in, in concerts at, in, at school. They were singing solos. And I, could, I felt that I could do it better. But I think it was the right thing for me because of my interest in theatricality, my visualness, the fact I got to stage, be, be an actor as well as, but text and it's words. But the oboe was the closest I came to, I thought, I think instinctively I chose the oboe because it's a little bit like the human voice, but then I thought maybe the cello, but definitely went for the oboe when I was about 11 the closest to singing somewhere subconsciously but it's funny isn't it because even as a singer you still have limits you still have a uh a register you can't be a full orchestra you can't be an organ you can't be a, a violin you can't be a brass band you can only still only be what you are with the voice you've got in here you can't have everybody else's voice and a lot of high sopranos want to be a mezzo and a lot of tenors want to be a soprano and the other way around and you know you always and people want to be somebody else I think we're all just trying to sing, aren't we, with whatever. I know my dear friend who I just did, a, the only concert I've done when I'm in lockdown um, was a concert at the Wigmore Hall two weeks ago. And he's a great pianist, Christian Blackshaw, and he's, he's 70. And all of his life, he's been trying to make the piano sing and he manages it. But he's been trying to make, and that's what he says, I just want to try and make it sing. And that's his life's work. So I don't know, I think we're all, Singing is the elemental thing. We came out of a cave before we banged anything together and people sang. So it's our gut reaction. And I'm lucky enough to do that. But I couldn't just sing unaccompanied songs. I've got to sing with a piano or with an orchestra. I'm still part of this big sound world. And I still, I'm happy when I stop singing and I can hear, oh my God, the strings start. And that's more magical that sound than anyone can ever start. Or there's a, a clarinet solo comes, you know, that comes out of the orchestra. So I just think, I don't know, really. I think we're all, I think we're all a sort of greater for us all doing the sum of our parts. The music is a limitless thing. Uh, but there is something special about the human voice that it's yours and yours only. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think Alyssa is going to ask a question next. Alyssa Mundy, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about Baroque repertoire specifically. I saw you sing um, Handel's Ariadante in like 2016 at the Canadian Opera Company. Um, oh. And it was a long time ago. Um, but it was just like one of my favorite productions. And I just wanted to know if you have any tips about singing Baroque roles or just tackling so much music. Because Handel is, a, even though it's considered easy and young singers should tackle it it's just it's considered easy well young singers are suggested to start with handle but I just think when you're tackling such a huge role in so much music do you have any tips of tackling broke repertoire in that sense that seems completely insane I mean it might be um that to sing it well uh you have to have a really you have to really have sorted yourself out or be very lucky and just be naturally gifted um, and it won't really harm you. I think that's why they give it to young singers, but there's no way is it easy. It's uh, the most virtuosic thing you can possibly do because you, you cannot get away, really. You really can't get away. If you're going to sing a beautiful handle line or if you're going to sing a, a very long um, coloratura aria, there's no way you can uh, hide behind tricks, really. Not if you're doing it properly. Um, 
tips, practice, 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 cry, practice, <laughs> cry a bit more, practice, think you could never do it, go back next week, do it, it's more, practice more, practice more, um, love the music, love it more than life itself, um, listen to everybody else doing it, um, come back, practice, practice more, cry, cry more, love it a bit more, but also I think one of the things yes. I've been thinking about is the fact that um, with Handel, it's two things. When you're doing recitative, um, really, th really think of yourself as an actor and really get led by the text yeah. and make sure your language, you are led by perfecting whichever language you're doing it in so that you can be an actor, so that you can get to the absolute truth of the recitative. But when you are singing an aria, also, be an actor and never just be an instrumentalist um, because Handel was a genius of text and of emotion and of meaning. And if you say, I love you 25 times in an aria, just in the A part, then you do it a couple and then you do it again. So you've got 50 times saying, I love you. Be sure that you really know why you love the person uh, 50 times over um, because Handel, he put it in the harmony and you listen to the harmony and the harmony will tell you why you love that person. But it's got to, if you are being honourable to handle, if you are making this sing like Shakespeare or like the greatest uh, musical realisation of humanity that Handel is, then you are going to delve as deep as you possibly can into that text and into the 50 times you're saying I love you from the harmony, from the shape of the phrase, um, and experiment, you know, billion times over in your kitchen. We, you know, cry and then let go. Don't try and get it technically right, but explore the meaning of it and then go back to the technical uh, and then to perfect, perfect the technical with the other thing added, but never abandon the meaning and never abandon the technical and then put it together. And that was another very long answer. Sorry. That was good. No, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Emily, Emily Noon, do you want to ask a question next? Hello. Um, actually, I love what you just said about Handel because I'm studying a lot of Handel at the moment. I just watched a recording of you singing Ombra My Fu from the ENO. So oh, it's quite God. surreal to be talking to you right now, but it was great. Um, I'm saying, oh, God, because I remember running. I wanted to go to the toilet and I was running from my dressing room and it was, a, in, it was recorded in, I know it keeps on coming up on YouTube, I think. People keep saying to me. And I just got my bus flattener done up and they, they sort of like attached my bus flattener to my um, underwear. I thought, I really need to pee. There's no time, we've got to come to the stage. If we're recording this, we've got to put it, we're gonna do a film, we're gonna put it out as an advertisement. Get to the stage, hurry up. And they were all wearing their normal clothes and the orchestra was all comfortable. There was me, I was dying to pee. Oh, under thy shade. And I was desperate, I was desperate. So anyway, I did my best, but I was slightly cross-eyed. Yeah, you, you didn't look at it ruffled at all. Um, I was going to ask, uh, I probably should know this already, but have you um, premiered a lot of like new works and how important is it to like work with sort of up and coming sort of new composers, but also how do you get in contact with them if you want to? Blimey, that's a really good question. I think there should be a, there should be a forum um, linking everybody up, a bit more of a visible one. If there is one, I don't know about it. Where, mm -hmm. because I mean, I was always over the years, I've been sent um, things in the mail that arrived two months later or something from a composer. They find where you are and where they're singing, they send things to you to look at. But I've also been really lucky to do um, quite a few contemporary operas to do the Tom Adders, Exterminating Angel, to do the Nico oh, yeah. Mooley Two Boys, and to have Nico write um, something for me and to have Judith Weir send something to me and write something for me I've been so lucky it is incredibly important um and then there's Alex the wonderful Alex Wolf who um wrote this amazing um he's a extraordinary um young composer which everybody everybody knows about of course he's just written an opera um and he's had quite a bit of exposure and I sang one of his songs um last year so I've been lucky but I don't think there's any forum where everybody can meet and say what is this piece of music you've just composed that reflects now, that reflects what we are feeling now, that is current, that is absolutely, because he's written the most amazing um, <laughs> a, a, a symphony about 
the motorway that actually sounds like the motorway, I think. And Nico Muli has written things that sound like the internet. We need music, of course, that is, I mean, not bad music. It needs to be the best music, but then one can only tell retrospectively. But we need art to be living. So we need to have artists in the old time, it would be the court. There would be the court and everybody be able to talk to each other. But I think um, there's no real support for composers out there to, to get um, their music performed. Um, and people tend with limited performing opportunities and people wanting to put um, audiences into uh, concert halls and opera houses that they tend to go for the old chestnuts. So I think we need to fight for each other a little bit more. And I just wish there was uh, a forum where we could give a lot more exposure to young composers, particularly. But um, I, I suppose it's, it's also maybe about um, sort of separating, because obviously not everything that's going to come out of all the new composers is going to be good. It, I suppose, do you pick and choose which ones you think will be good, like that you particularly like, or do you just do everything that you, you're given? An honest answer is that I've had very little time to do even the things that I wanted to do for main repertory. And I've had very little time in the diary to actually learn the whole, the, the thing of actually having to learn so much music. It's like having your A-levels constantly for 25 years that you literally probably sometimes are on holiday learning music. Well, you always are. You're never without learning music. And there's never pockets of time in which to spend six weeks sitting down and learning a new contemporary piece. A lot of the time, I haven't had time to learn things that I wanted to learn or give it that time um, to do things that are really, really interesting because you have to say no, because I've got to go off and do Carabino, you know, in, in an opera house. But um, I have done very little, really, relatively speaking, and I would have loved to have done a lot more. But I have been, the, the things I have done, I've been very um, lucky to do. And there are a lot of people that spend a lot more time and are better at it than me, particularly with the, the challenges of harmony and rhythm, of which oh, can be a little bit challenging, are better than me at doing it. But the, the stuff that I've done has been an extremely valuable thing to me artistically, to be in the room with the creator. Uh, and to actually sing a song with Alex Wolf at the piano, knowing exactly as it should be and to be able to ask him and to be able to hear the tempo, to be able to hear the colors in the piano, to be able to hear his creativity and be in the room with somebody who's actually creating something so great and be a part of that is something the rest of the time, we call it classical music, but it isn't, it's just historical music. We don't get a chance to be in the room with that creativity and have, Nico Muli sitting in a rehearsal at the Metropolitan Opera for two boys where he was actually adjusting as he went along the piece and just walk over and say, I can't get this word out. I can't, this word doesn't sound right. Um, in the sentence, I'll change that, I'll just change that. Okay, fine. You come back and it's, it's become more, it sounds more like you or, you know, it's seeing him at, the, the, at his keyboard creating um, trying to make something sound like somebody stand next to uh, a, a wall of computers having very confused thoughts. Seeing somebody trying to do that and being creative is inspiring for a million and one reasons. It inspires creativity in, in oneself and in everyone uh, in the room and in, in the community. It, it opens up whole new ways of thinking to approach music in the past and music now. That's another very long answer. I'm so sorry. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speaking of uh, young composers, um, can Henry Page ask a question next? Please. That was that was great timing. Um, thank you so much, um, Alice. It's it's lovely, lovely to hear some of your anecdotes, and um, it feels really appropriate to be talking about um, contemporary rep because I was um, I was going to ask you specifically um, about what you um, obviously really like to see in the new work when you're seeing it, you're obviously making reference to the fact that you don't have enough obviously time to look through things so much because you're very you know obviously so busy and there's so much rep to do but I mean obviously with something like The Voice of Desire which I think is beautiful by the way and, and, and a, a really wonderful work. There's oh, which, a, which work? Uh, the Voice of Desire. The uh, Voice of the, Desire. The, Judith Weir. Yes. yes. Wrote to you. I think it's a wonderful you know Judith. wonderful piece yeah. and She's really good at obviously getting into the psyche of the performer she's going to write for and writing something that's very appropriate mm. for that person. And 
I just really wondered, I mean, um, there's obviously, obviously a lot of different styles of new music out there because the sort of the micro genre, as it were, in terms of new vocal music. And I speak also as a, as a singer as well, because I do quite a lot of, of, of singing on the, on the mm. side. Mm. And it's a very difficult balance, I think, to find something that also feels like it can push the boundaries, but at the same time be, you know, have a bit of line, be sung on the voice, not always just be difficult and, and divisive. And I just wondered if, if there was ever anything you see where you go, oh, I immediately like this, or I, I like to see certain things in a, in a vocal work, especially a chamber vocal work that might be sung in a concert performance. Oh, golly, I mean, I, mm. um, well, I mean, honestly, I, if I immediately look at something, uh, and I certainly know, look at the text of what it's saying, and if, if I'm interested in that, but also if I really, honestly, if I look at something and I am immediately feeling that my, um, it would be better uh, sung or performed by a violin or an oboe or a piano or a keyboard and that I feel that it isn't actually um, needing me, needing my specific gifts, needing my specific voice, needing, if it's gonna hurt me, it, but if it's going to be something that quite often uh, I've shied away from um, modern music because contemporary music, because I felt um, alienated from it, if I'm completely honest with you. I felt the sort of, it's, that it's very been very much faithful to the times we live in, but I don't love the times we live in. That it has truthfully and honestly reflected uh, a disintegration of our um, humanity um, in the feeling of, our flesh and blood being the most important thing. It feels like quite often it's a, it's a it reflects a sort of a disjointed element to our souls right now that is truthfully expressing that a lot of our lives are online or fragmented or, or, or disenfranchised from our own sort of peaceful humanity of being, um, you know, it's not Goethe, it's not somebody sitting under a tree and looking at the leaves falling, it's I feel so alienated from life because I don't know what the path is because there's not a second for me to hold a train of thought. And that is very faithfully um, portrayed. It's a mechanical response quite often. And I feel, do I need to lend my voice to this? Do I want to express that? And quite often I actually, honestly, ha that's not the thing inside me that I've wanted to express. I've wanted to, reject that part of our modern life and not display it in art. I've wanted to get back to me under a tree. I wanted to get back to me singing something of beauty, like a beautiful chair, like a beautiful painting, like the, you know, the arch of a ballet, ballerina's arm. And if I don't see something of beauty in it, I don't hear in something in my mind's eye beauty, then I'm afraid I'm very old fashioned, that it can be fleeting beauty, but I want to see Tr not so much beauty, truth. I want to see truth. Um, if I can't recognize truth in it, uh, then I'm not interested. I don't know what that means. Um, and that's another very long answer, but I'd love to hear what you as a composer want to express. And if you recognize anything that I've said as being something that you totally reject, or you see as valid or can understand my, that that sort of particularly um, sort of singer's point of view. I mean, do, do I sound like a bit of a twit? <laughs> not, not at all. No, I, I I was I really empathise with the aspect of of you feeling how contemporary vocal music's left behind some aspect of the purely beautiful or the purely artistic and has maybe degenerated into something much more fractious or, or that is purely illustrative of the modern age to the extent that maybe the inherent writing from the composer yields something that although very accomplished and very technically impressive is maybe just not very pleasant to sing. Maybe it has no line, maybe it has no, no, no seeming through context or continuity for the singer to get hold of. And I think speaking as a performer, I don't like singing those pieces despite being a contemporary composer. And so I think there's a, I think for instance, why people like Jonathan Dove, for instance, a lot because oh, he's- Love Jonathan Dove. Line. You know, he's got he's some lovely genius. ideas. 
it's great, isn't it? But it, it maintains something, it maintains an honesty and conviction in the sense of Erlany and line, which I think every singer still wants because they can find truth in, in, that, in that, that kind of sense of linearity. And I think a lot of pieces now from contemporary composers, especially I think pieces for the concert hall, can be very disjointed and very fractious. And as you say, maybe as well, the obfuscations in the over complexity of the notation. And, I, and I'm not saying that every composer does it, and I'm certainly not saying that it's an imposter thing, but sometimes it can be quite daunting and alienating in a way I think sometimes it doesn't need to be. I think there's a, a great intimacy in vocal music, which I think some contemporary composers can struggle to capture. And I think certainly, I certainly do that, and I need to understand, I think I need a kind of harmonic context and series before I set a subject so I can understand how the range can lend itself to a voice, for instance, in a way. Yeah. And I I think singers love, I mean, it, it's horrible and redacted to say singers love a good tune. They, we love something to sing, but you want something to sing, you know, not just something that's very clever and has got lots of sibilance and aspiration and things that don't really add up to a total artwork, I think, which is- a, God, I, know, yeah. That was so brilliantly put. Absolutely, I wish I'd been writing that down. That was that was that was it. That's totally it. I wish I could express myself as beautifully, but uh, um, I totally know what you mean. But I think it does come down to the the truth of our of singing is. Um, I've got a wonderful teacher, um, uh, Diana Harris, who who works um, who teaches at the Royal. Uh, College of Music and she always says um, singing is happy shouting you know it, it's it's speech it is communication and if we lose that basic um, thing because you never hear somebody go I want to do a zoom call I want you know they, nobody unless they are hysterical that somewhere in the middle of Syria trying to get out which they, I hope they, they're not um, we we naturally cannot help but the first voice we hear is our mother or our father speaking to us talking to us there's a there's a form of language language has a form the voice has a form in its communication and, 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 and centuries of of that can't be eradicated from our sensibility um it's deep in our hard wiring and it's definitely deep in mine um things either speak to me or they don't See, you're better at it than expressing it than I am. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Henry. Um, I think this is going to be our last question, uh, but it's which is sad. But it's uh, Sam Snowden. If you'd like to take the floor. Hi. Um, I, I got the impression earlier when you were talking that the text of any work is incredibly important to you, especially especially in song, um, but obviously in opera as well. When we've got these pieces of music, whether it be Handel or contemporary, where the music is so challenging, like you might be jumping up and down all over the place, how do you prioritise the text in some ways? I'm learning a song by Roderick Williams at the moment, which <gasps> is just Roddy. so, it's so very much, da, 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 and I, it doesn't connect with the piano part as brilliant as it is. It's sometimes really hard to get all of that musical stuff in but the text is brilliant at the same what time. What is the song about? Um, it's a story, it's a man who's asking a woman what she does for a living. She keeps giving him loads of presents, but doesn't say what she does. And then at the end, um, it actually turns out that she's under arrest because she's nicked everything. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, dear. So, yeah, but what... So what was the question? I just want to sing. Just, I want to sing that song now. Will you send me the sheet music? I just... Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, oh. when we've got these difficult musical things. How how do you go about prioritizing the text and the actual meaning of a song without getting too bogged down with all the technicalities in the music? Well, I mean, the music wouldn't have been. Well, I mean, better ring up Roddy. Can we ring him up? Has anybody got his number? But presumably, he came across that text. Did he write it himself? Um, to before he thought of the music. So, I mean, it's just, you cannot do anything but sing the meaning of the song, sing the, the context of the story, sing exactly minute to minute, second to second, what that, that, that story is. I mean, it's, um, what are the specific sort of problems of that song? Is it very, very yeah, the, disjointed? 
the, yeah, the melody is very disjointed. But I find the same thing sometimes in Handel arias as well. And so it's not unique to um, contemporary music in the fact that when we've got these disjointed phrases that aren't the beautiful line or um, a great tune, as Henry said before, that sometimes I always find that it's difficult to focus on getting the text across because I'm so concerned about getting the right notes or the right musicality. Yeah, I mean, if it's the greatest music, usually it should ma the two should match and shouldn't work against each other. But that's not often the case. I mean, it's, it's just a case of, I mean, I always try to um, just remember um, that it is just all in, my voice is just an instrument that doesn't stop just because it's high or low, and it may be disjointed, that a line is still a line, whatever it is, even if it's, a, it's still a line because I'm not actually using a different instrument. I'm not like alternating, you know, a, a lamp post and a clarinet and a trombone. I'm not having to that construct one bit for one bit. It's still my, there's still an inherent line, even in the most disjointed bit of music, because it's your voice and because you're on setting pitches that are by nature, whatever they are, related to each other and are part of a musical line, however uh, extreme it can be, it is still a line that's expressing something with text in it. And the text is inherently not separate, actually. I mean, you can practice it separately so that you can, you know, get the patter off, but actually you piece it together, you know, um, consonant to vowel to consonant to vowel to consonant to vowel to, to pitch to pitch to whatever it is as as a, as a piece and the meaning hopefully in totally um dictates the way you onset that note or the way you choose to do a, a one that consonant to that vowel and the color of it and the volume of it and the way you use it in your register whether it's on set it from below, whether it's on set it from the middle, or we think it from above, whether you think about it in relation to the next note from the one before, what the color of the idea is, what the what the um, the mood is, what your emotions are, how you actually feel about singing that note. It's just limitless, and that's why it's so exciting. But there always is one and the same thing, even though it feels like it's two separate things, it never is. Never. Does that make any sense? Yeah, definitely. In fact, that sort of helps because I've always sat thought, especially with this song that I'm learning, that Roddy's voice is so beautiful and lyrical when he's singing like Butterworth songs. And it was I was actually sat there going, this is really strange because what he's written is doesn't seem to reflect what he, how he sings. But actually, if I think of it like that, it does. Well, he's probably been unbelievably clever and is totally... Um, I can imagine, I just want that song, that he's, he, it's just like a kleptomaniac, like the frenetic um, idea of somebody wanting more and more and more. And it's making them just like, want this and want that and want that and want this and I want this and I'm not going to tell you. And I can imagine it's just genius. But there's a human being beating inside that song and there's a line of thought and a line of meaning in it. And you'll find it, I'm sure. Fab, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, thanks, Alice, so much for this. And to Thank all, you. Um, it was a lot of fun. Asking questions. Um, I suppose I might wrap up with um, the cliche question I didn't have time for earlier, which is one that always comes out, and I'm sure you have a brilliant answer for, which is a, a you know, piece of advice to yourself at, at our stage, um, you know, or, or if not necessarily for yourself, but for us going out into the world in, in, this, in this strange environment. Um, any last words of wisdom, basically? <laughs> It, I'm, golly, just lots and lots of luck and love. But um, I would just say that it must, it, it does feel like a scary time right now, but I would say don't lose perspective. This is only a few months in your lives. I spent years, I spent 10 years floating around, doing different things, having crises, having a, a very, very, difficult disjointed time and times where I wasn't performing at all I was just standing in my kitchen in my parents house with them had they had a television program on and I was singing along to you know Adele's aria from um Fledermaus things I shouldn't be singing or trying to sing Zerbinetta or trying to sing along to Janet Baker or trying to sing along to different singers or listening to music I was alone and I thought there wasn't a path forward for me but actually that was the best time I ever had 
and it's only a few months. You might feel like, oh, the world stopped. It's never going to happen. It's only your people are young. You're very, very young. And you, the world is yours. You can make it what you want. But you will only be able to make it what you want to make good things in the world if you know what you want to make and if you know yourself. And now is the time to find out what that is when you're away from competition from other people, when you're away from all the mixed stupid messages that we get sent daily from social media, which is really a load of tosh. It's all gloss. It's not what we, we all decided want to stand up and make music for. It's not what you want to make music for when you're in your own bedroom thinking in the morning, what is the meaning of life? Do I want to carry on trying to do this? I suggest that it's, it's not that reason, all of that gloss and that noise. So I would say, look at this as a gift right now. And it, it will go by really quick. And you'll look back and think, well, that felt like World War Three, but that was only 12 months, 16 months, 18 months. And it maybe was the best time that I ever had. I got to find out who I am and why the world needs me. And it's not necessarily for going and sing at the Met or for going and, you know, being the glossiest person in the world. It might mean that you find that you don't want to do this or you want to do it in a different way, or you want to give something to the world that you never knew you wanted to give until something really hard was asked of you, or you had enough time to think, what really matters to me? And maybe that's a gift right now. And I would say, grasp it and, and live with it and sit with it and be happy about being unhappy about it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Alice. Lots of luck and love to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, and bye.